you know, 95 out of 100, I tell them no. Really? Yeah, because, you know, I mean, we could get into that if that's Yeah, it. I'll hit record now and just, uh, <clears throat> so why is that? Are we recording? We're now? recording, yeah, just, yeah, tell me why that is. Well, because... And I'll do the formal intro in a second, but yeah, let's hear about this. The reason, the reasons are... Um, just to catch the first part, the reasons are you tell people market, not to. You market in direct mail, you virtually always lose money on the first transaction. Mm -hmm. Have to be able to invest in that first transaction and gener and generate a relationship with that person, mm -hmm. such that over time the money they spend makes that a profitable relationship for you. Mm -hmm. Printing and postage for most businesses is prohibitively expensive. The time frame to mail and then analyze results takes weeks and sometimes months, as opposed to hours or days online. Right. For many companies, the target market is not even on the radar screen in the direct mail list world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, price points are extremely sensitive. There's a you know, there's a much higher range of price points for information products online than offline. You know, offline you can't really get more than maybe seventy or eighty or ninety nine bucks, whereas into the online you can go into the hundreds and thousands. Right. So the direct mail channel, in many ways. Is prohibitive to the economics and the, you know the entire business model for many online companies. Yeah. This is real talk with Michael Fishman. And <laughs> so, what companies should and shouldn't do direct mail then? What company, are there certain companies or types of companies that should do direct mail? Yeah, I think um, companies. Well, number one, um, a company that, like I said, can wait can wait for that relationship to be cut to work in their economic model, yeah. which for most companies entails some kind of a profit, um, and that can take months, and it, sometimes it could take over a year, right. you know, depending on what the cost, what the price of the initial transaction was, and how much you have to sell them into that relationship going forward. Yeah, um, you know, and then you know, depending on subject matter. Whether there are lists in the, in the direct mail world that um, that are available, you know, that would be predictive to work for for the subject that you've got, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's tennis or gardening or health or investing or um, you know how to you know make a car engine or you know whatever it might be. Right. All right, Michael. So we'll do the formal intro. I just had to get your take on that because that was interesting. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm a founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. I've been waiting months and months for Michael Fishman. Today we have Michael Fishman who's one of the legends of marketing. He's been a leading advisor for over 20 years. Just a little bit about Michael. He, this is exactly why you should listen to him. He, and I saw him at the Titans. He's just, when he talks, gold comes out. I'm not even kidding. I'm not just trying to flatter you. I'm being serious with that. He worked with Rodale for 17 years to help grow the prevention and men's health publishing brands. He's worked with large organizations such as Boardroom, Agora, Reader's Digest, many more. He has been in charge of some of the largest mailings. That's why he will talk about mailings, he just did, that have been ever been executed in the consumer market. He's also provided consulting to help Bulletproof.com and Coffee. Michael has led the annual Consumer Health Summit since 1994, which is an invitation-only event for CEOs and entrepreneurs in the health and wellness space. He's worked with some of the top health personalities, Dr. Andrew Wild, Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Deepak Chopra, and a long list of others. And he's also co-founder of Behavior Con, which is a conference which features entrepreneurs and business leaders speaking on consumer psychology and behavioral economics. Michael, thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> it's a treat to be here. Thanks, Jeremy. So I want to start off with the Titans. You spoke at Titans. And what's one of your favorite interactions? And we'll get into kind of your background and everything. What was one of your favorite interactions and stories and what you learned from the Titans event? Wow. <laughs> um, well, you know, in many respects, Titans was, for me, a revisiting of some of the history that I've lived through mm -hmm. um, in, in, the, in the marketing lessons and mentors. I mean, I, mentors of mine were on stage. Gary Bensavenga mm -hmm. is, a, is an icon and a mentor to me and to so many. Um, so there was a, quite a bit of history there, which I think was instructive for everybody, whether mm -hmm. they lived through it or not. Um, 
But I think uh, hearing Greg Renker, the, one of the co-founders of Guthy Renker, which is one of the, made probably the, easily the largest infomercial production company, and um, the success there has been massive. Their sales are, I think, north of a billion a year, maybe two billion. And, um, Gre you know, Gre just I love the personality. I, I don't know Greg, but his personality is just modest and gracious. Yeah. And he's a low key dude, and he mixes right in with the with the group, and does not feel exalted in any way. And you know that that was inspiring um, yeah. because I think you know who who we remain as people as we grow in our in our careers and in our financial abundance and in our impact. Um, you know, I mean, he's just a great example of somebody who um, you know maintains kind of a grace. Yeah. Um, oh, for sure. And, and he was on stage with his marketing director and learning about how they manage personalities in their infomercials in terms of a tactical response to you um, was just quite interesting because I'm very, very fascinated with personal brands and personalities and how they market and position themselves. And um, so, the, you know, the way in which they manage relationships and the way in which some of their some of their partners are very willing to participate and do whatever it takes to make a project work mm -hmm. and others you know kind of limit themselves so I don't know if you remember this part to you know I'll give you two or three hours and that's all you get and it was just interesting that they do you know there's there's a range of personalities and, yes. and how, how celebrities you know make themselves available and and you know Greg just presented that in a very interesting and informative way Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I remember one thing I read about you is that you help people go from that whatever their persona is good, their personal brand to that's who I want to be at the top, mm -hmm. right? So what's an example of what you helped coach or what you helped one of these people or, or personal brands do <laughs> to get to – everyone wants that, right? They want to get from that good to the, the top. Yeah, just so everybody knows, Jeremy's departing from the script. <laughs> um, well, I actually have a talk called the Personal Branding Checklist, so okay. I'm not unprepared for that question. You know what? You know, I say this because I told you I was being serious before we talked. Is the intro? I could probably we could talk. I could ask you a question for ten hours just on the intro alone. I'm, I'm trying to be disciplined, but you're it's too enticing, so I have to ask you that. Well, here's the—I mean, here's the thing about personalities, yeah. um, and this is something that isn't really trainable or coachable, um, you know. But one of the things I say on stage quite a bit is that um, if if the ego of the speaker, if the ego of the personality is more prominent than his or her message, then trust with the audience mm. is diminished. Interesting. So, so if. If ego is more prominent than message, mm -hmm. trust is diminished, and really kind of like trust heads for the exits. In fact, mm -hmm. and um, and you know, like a lot of things in life, including caring and hospitality, and you know, certain things aren't coachable or trainable. You either care or you don't. You you're either drawn to uh, have an impact in the world, or you're drawn to further your own self or you know self interest. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's it's. It's something. I mean, I don't work with personalities who don't really embody that. Right. But I do. I do say it on stage so that people just have a sense. Um, and I mean, I, I guess it is possible in a transformational sense for someone to shift from an ego orientation to a purpose or a message orientation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to say that's not possible because I think it is. Mm -hmm. But I think people have to have an awareness when they're leading with their ego versus leading with their purpose or their message. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a big thing about personal brands, um, you know, and that they be comfortable in their own skin, that they not be like, like Dr. Mark Hyman, who's a good friend of mine. You know, if you see him on stage at a conference or you see him on the Dr. Oz show or you have lunch with him one on one, it's the same guy. Mm -hmm. There's no persona for TV. There's no persona for stage. I mean, that's just a, like an authentic guy. And, you know, and, you know, for men and women who are, you know, have an outward face and who are in the public eye, um, you know, that's when, like when people talk about media coaches, I always say, well, unless they're coaching you just to liberate yourself, you know, if they're coaching you to be something other than what you are, then that's the wrong direction. 
you, you know, you, the, the best way to, to secure trust and whatever your other objectives are is to just bring your authentic self. And so, you know, what, what, what we really need to do as personal brands, as opposed to taking things on, is to shedding all the other layers mm -hmm. until what's really just left is us. Right. So I promise, you know, Michael, I'll get back to some of my questions, which I, I'm going to ask. But I have to ask one more about the intro, which is, so you help Bulletproof.com and coffee. What are some of the things that worked? What did you do with them? Well, that's, you know, that's interesting. Um, you know, Bulletproof Coffee is, you know, a, quite a phenomenon right now. And, of course, I believe that is a sustainable trajectory that that business is on. Um, and Bulletproof Coffee for everybody is, is uh, toxin-free coffee that's brewed in the conventional manner and then blended with uh, grass-fed butter and um, uh, a medium-chain triglyceride oil, which is a component mm -hmm. of coconut oil. Yeah. Very good for the brain and the body for fat loss and stuff like that. And it's 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 a, it's really a phenomenon. It's been discussed all over big TV and stuff. Um, you know, it's I mean, it's interest. It's an interesting question because it's connected to this idea of personal branding. Because the mm -hmm. origins of Bulletproof were the you know like the the, the positive reputation of the, of their founder Dave Asprey, who's very well known in what's called the biohacking community. Mm -hmm. um, and you know my guidance has been, and they've really accepted this, is that for Bulletproof to become the eight and nine figure brand that it's headed, it's in eight figures and headed for nine, um, that Dave would need to be someone who was a little more off stage than on stage. So, so what does that mean? Well, it's it's the difference between positioning a business with a personality like Oprah, Martha Stewart, Tony Robbins, you know, people like that. That's positioning the business with the name. I gotcha. Humanizing a business allows it to be bulletproof, allows it to be Zappos, allows it to be Amazon, allows it to be you know, Southwest Airlines. But the founder or the CEO is visible a little bit off stage, mm -hmm. humanizing it, providing warmth, providing a foundation of trust, but the future of that business does not rest on the shoulders of that person. Mm -hmm. And it's a different way of positioning a business in the mind of the consumer. It's certainly a different way of positioning a business in terms of um, a transaction or selling that business. Um, businesses are, you know, the, I mean, the interesting balance is that businesses positioned with, with personalities generate a very long lifetime value from, from the clients and customers. People love resonating with personalities. Right. But it's hard to sell a business that is dependent on the presence and the health and the ethical behavior of that personality because sometimes those things don't work out. Right. So how do you do that? Because it's very, you know, it's probably pretty connected, right? Well, we, I mean, there, we, there's this, you know, <laughs> we have this word in the, the, you know, which I think is, um, you know, we, we've been, I mean, Dave has, you know, slowly been sort of moving away from center stage is essentially what it is. And, um, you know, the coffee and the supplements and the various uh, ingestible products that they sell are branded, you know, as, um, you know, as upgraded self. And so it's, you know, it's, it's becoming a business that's positioned and anchored for this very steep high climb, um, which it's already on. Um, and, you know, it enables them to go into retail, enables them to go into their own store, have their own stores, which there will be one momentarily in Los Angeles. Um, so for a multi-platform business that's selling over the web, that is selling in, say, other, other retail stores and then ultimately opening their own coffee shops, um, you know, the multiple platforms will be best enabled by a business that is not on the shoulders of an individual mm -hmm. man or woman. Mm -hmm. So what's your process, Michael? So, you know, they, you know, want to work with you. Where do you, where do you start? What do you do first when you bring a company on to, to work with you? Um, so as an advisor, um, I mean, the, fir the first thing I really do is um, really find out what had that entrepreneur, that founder, start that business in the first place. I want to know why they did it, like at the soul level, if possible. And that's not a new agey kind of inquiry. It's a, like it's a very real business question. Right. Like, why are you here and why are you doing this? It's super, like, street, like, very down-to-earth question. It's like, why are you doing this? And just so I can understand, 
And there are no right or wrong answers. Right. There's just whatever the answer is. And I want to understand that. Yeah. Um, you know, I also want to understand, of course, what the goals are, what the challenges are, you know, in the coming months, in the coming year, fiscal or calendar, and then, you know, going forward. Are they looking for an exit in, in, in a foreseeable period of time? Um, you know, and of course, what are the challenges in, in marketing and, and name and customer acquisition? Um, and, you know, I've, I've, st I've worked with brand new startups and I've worked with, mat you know, quote unquote, mature companies that are at some level of scale. Um, but, you know, the key is to go from whether it's from inception to some level of, of uh, consistent maintenance or, or, you know, kind of cruising altitude or from cruising altitude to higher. Mm -hmm. you know, cruising altitude to stratosphere or just like great to greater mm -hmm. you know because I don't really go in and consider anybody to be broken although I guess some companies are broken but um, you know I'm fortunate to work with people that either are starting and have the ingredients for crazy success and we leverage and harness that or I'm going into companies that are at some degree of scale whether that's for a year or 30 years right and we just identify where we can get measurable improvements, whether that's a 20% improvement or a 500% improvement mm -hmm. in various marketing metrics, and just go nuts. Yeah. I ask this because these are the same questions I should ask myself with a business and anyone should ask themselves. So I wanted to hear your thought process behind it. And so what was one thing that you identified that gave a company or helped give a company that trajectory or growth? Well, I, I could tell you, I'll, I'll give you the answer from 20 years ago and I'll give you the answer from today. Okay. Um, you know, the 20 year ago answer, which still works and will work for the next 100 years or however long, because, you know, my lens into the marketplace is psychology and language and why, right. you know, being able to predict what people do, you know, so that, so that marketing tests are not just clever ideas that we kind of hope will work. I mean, yeah, we hope our tests will work. But the idea is to, is to understand the psychological triggers in human beings mm -hmm. so that you can design marketing tests that actually ha have a, like a, str a real reason and expectation to work. Right. And then your batting average just goes up like crazy. But, you know, say 20, 15 or 20 years ago, what I realized and will be true, you know, in essence forever, is that certain niches that people are in are really not niches at all and when you think you're in niche you're painting yourself into a corner or you're putting yourself in a you know like a self-fulfilling prophecy box that contains and limits your business and the best example in the world is his health you know health is a niche that really is completely not a niche at all because it, it's universal you know, everybody can take steps to either you know improve something that possibly they've already come down with or a condition or a challenge they've already got or to prevent things that they don't have. Um, and so, and there's varying degrees of difficulty getting people to prevent things versus deal with things they were already challenged with. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're more motivated to deal with what they've got versus preventing something they don't have. But in general, in health and fitness um, and longevity, those are... Um, universal subjects they're not niche niche subjects and the you know the effective messaging and effective uh, sales copy or, or headlines and those kinds of you know sales letters or whatever can trigger people with no prior participation in any health business whatsoever to actually take action in taking some degree of responsibility for their health and so you know 20 years ago for Rodale which is the prevention brand as, as well as men's health and su supporting them in the marketing of their books, you know, the, the marketing campaigns for their health books were comprised of lists and, you know, JV partners, what have you. And maybe 70 or 80% of those other lists had nothing to do with health. Hmm. And that was a breakthrough for them. And it was something that I envisioned could be harnessed and, and was harnessed across, you know, pro way over 100 launches. Um, and you can't do, you know, you can't ever, the best copy in the world will not convince anybody to start knitting, to start <laughs> right. you know, fly fishing or golfing or, you know, bird watching. I mean, people, there are such things as niches, but health isn't one of them, right? I same see. thing, same thing with money or personal finance and same thing with self-improvement. Mm -hmm. The right messaging will get somebody to participate in those subjects 
whether they've ever done it or not. And then, um, so that was that was the lesson then, and the lesson. What was the question again? The the question was about. Um, I don't even remember the question. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, I'll come. It was up. it was basically, um, you know, when you're talking about, um, you know, you were talking about before what the big lesson was, and I was asking about what is one thing someone's identified you identified that gave them that trajectory. Um, oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you. So, uh, you know, make sure if you're health if you're in health, money, or personal development. You're not in a niche, really, and in some subjects you are in a niche. And the lesson there is: don't try to get people to be bird watchers if they're not, because that's not going to be a, a economically effective. You know, today's learning is um, really the extent to which I mean, I mean people's email opt-in lists, people's the the email lists that that people build from their websites. For most companies, that's the most important source of. Um, I mean, people are opting in without paying anything, and that email list is generally, for most companies, the most important source of people who will become actual paying customers. You know, an email name is anywhere from 10 to 50 times as valuable in real money as a Facebook like, depending on the business. And so, if you can triple the size of your email list, depending on your um, proficiency in moving those people from an opt in to an actual transaction, if you triple your list, you are multiplying the top line of your business. Right. And, you know, when you look, I mean, the way I look at, I mean, number one, Google sends organic traffic, not, for the most part, not to people's home pages, but to their internal pages for blogs and articles, because that's where the search traffic goes. I mean, the home page is everybody's glamour page, but they might get 20 or 30 percent of their email opt ins from their actual home page, and the other. 70 or 80 percent on blogs and articles that are in you know in turn on the inside of the site which is where Google is sending traffic um, so you need to be su super effective at harnessing mm -hmm. people's satisfaction when, after they read your blog posts and you also need to have a particularly effective strategy for dealing with your um, with your home page which you know deals with not just the opt-in box but the entire page top to bottom Colors, typefaces, photos, words, net, you know, positioning, how many links. If you look at the home page as an ecosystem that is either where every single component is either for or against the initiation of a relationship, you can get a five or six or seven hundred percent increase in email opt ins versus just tinkering around with the opt in function itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to ask you about the fun fact, even though I have five more questions brewing from what you just said. What's a fun fact, Michael, that most people don't know about you? <laughs> <laughs> this will be this will be like super random, um, but this brain, which is like sometimes challenged, um, is holding a ridiculous amount of information that almost nobody wants to know about uh, jazz, <laughs> okay, and about um, like tropical fish and marine biology, also. Just you know, two like, interests that you have, or yeah, well, like Latin names of fish, and you're just crazy. Really? Yeah, and uh, you know who appeared on what record of you know jazz recording, and who played with who. So, because both of those are are passions, you know, I haven't made the time for them in recent years, but mm -hmm. a lot of that data still resides. Just from a young age, did you always listen to jazz, or from from like well, really seventeen or eighteen, the beginning of college to the present time. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I've like 3,000 LPs, um, you know, I've heard, and I've heard most of them. Um, and I've had, you know, freshwater fish for most of my life as well. So, and I worked in a tropical fish store as a teenager. So, that, I hope that qualifies. Yeah, that qualifies for a fun fact for sure. So, I want to hear about what a big influence for you was growing up. Yeah. Fiji water. Um, <laughs> I don't know why, you know, it comes from the South Pacific, you think it's clean. Um, so, I mean, growing up, I, you know, I, I didn't really have uh, examples in my family around, you know, business particularly or leadership or, you know, there weren't books about business around. Um, and my, you know, I had no idea my path would be business. I didn't know what my path would be because I was always a biology and science sort of geek in a way. Um, As was I, yeah. 
which is why I guess I understand, you know, the health and fitness world and things like what ailments, you know, co, you know, happen together and what you would call comorbidities and things like that. Um, but the one thing I always paid attention to in sports was um, tennis players. Hmm. And just, you know, this idea, uh, particularly in the big events of the five set match, like the marathon and what it really took to persevere through, I mean, you know, um, so when I, you know, and I just, I haven't thought about it really before you asked this question and I've been reading through your materials and, uh, so I think just watching the perseverance and kind of the, what I would call that hand-to-hand kind of gladiator situation of, you know, sing, singles tennis at the highest level, men and women both, um, you know, just the perseverance, the conviction, and the fact that um, what really separates number one in the world from maybe number 100 is more conviction than physical skill. Hmm. Um, there are some differences in game technique, but I think psychology is the differentiator. Um, so I think, so I think I, I saw perseverance and I, and I think I learned or observed that if you stick with something long enough, you know, if you don't give up, you can make it through. And, you know, that's what I would say. Did you watch a lot of tennis or play tennis or why, why tennis? Both. Yeah. Cause I played and watched, didn't really have much connection to any other sports, but as a, as a player and as a spectator, mm having been to the US Open to like super high stakes, high pressure matches late in the tournament. Yeah. It's a Grand Slam tournament, everything's on the line. There have been two guys have been out there for four hours. Mm-hmm. And that's when you can cut the, the pressure with a knife and that's what I think that's what fans live for in every sport, right? right. Is high stakes, is yeah. the high stakes moment. Yeah. Um so that was what it was for me. Convic- conviction's huge. Where do you where did you see people were getting their conviction from? Or where do you get your conviction from to keep? Because as I read the your bio, you're doing a million things. You could probably have just done one of those things and been fine. But you keep going, going, going. What? Where do you I, think that conviction comes I, from? I, I appreciate that. I don't think I'm as prolific as as many of the people that I know or even hang out with. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think conviction is you know I'm like in. In uh, like in wearable devices, the uh, like what we call quantified self, these various devices that measure your per- physical performance and whatnot, <clears throat> and they have this, you know, the marketers or the psychology around these things looks at intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Right. You know, are you motivated by external factors, wanting to look good to other people, wanting to be impressive, wanting mm-hmm. to flex your muscles and you know tweak your feathers and whatever. Right. Or are you intrinsically motivated by mm-hmm. the desire to be confident, the desire to be successful, the desire to feel fulfilled and happy in that? And um, so I think conviction is when it's sustainable. You know, if it's if it's something you can actually hold on to for decades and and mm-hmm. you know, you know, your life is is something that generates internally, mm-hmm. or what what we might say intrinsic motivation. Yeah. Um, and and that, and that probably comes from purpose. You know, having a purpose other than money. Yeah. You know, I, I think the people actually the people that have the most money never woke up to make money. They wake up in the morning to help people, mm-hmm. to provide value, to do helpful stuff, to solve problems. You know, if you solve a problem for a billion people, the money's handled. Right. <laughs> right. You know. So. If you're if you're if you have a purpose or a calling or a mission yeah. to, to be helpful to other people, um, you know, I mean, look, that's noble, no, whether you're helping one person or a million. But if you can, if at scale, at scale, um, the be, you know the best way to, to be financially abundant is not to to wake up with that as your purpose. The, mm-hmm. the, you have a purpose to be helpful, and you can find platforms and ways to scale to help. You know, a high number, a great number of people, while still having your solution be effective and still being able to answer those people's questions. I mean, really, the customer care function in business, the money is handled. Yeah, it's, and that's and that's different from if you do what you're passionate about, the money will come. I don't think that's always true. Right. Passionate poets can starve. I mean, you know, we know that. Um, so it, it it does take a business, I think, to to make that happen. Yeah. 
Yeah, and going from that, we were saying that number one to that 100, there's a difference of conviction and drive. What drives you to keep going? Well, so far, I mean, I've been doing this right around 30 years. Right. And I'm pumped and fired up to do it every day. I'm not yeah. hired or exhausted. I mean, it's just, it continues to be an exciting um kind of space in, in, in health and wellness, particularly which are the categories that I work in. Um, and, you know, so far, I mean, I've just had a blast enabling and improving the, 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 the performance and really the impact of the various healers and the various publishers and the, you know, the various businesses I've had the honor and privilege to work with. Um, and, you know, I think, and I'll continue to do that as I now also focus on um, the impact I can personally have in a more direct way with speaking and developing a book and, you know, other platforms around me. Um, once again, not, not to have my name in lights, you know, if, if, I mean, like, I think the biggest test for any personality is if you could push a button and have the impact that you're committed to happen in the world and no one ever knew it was you that pushed the button, would you push the button? You know, in other words, if, if you could create what you're committed to in the world and get zero credit, would you be okay with that? Mm -hmm. And everybody I know would be like, of, of course, you know, because it's not about them or their name, it's about an outcome. Mm -hmm. so, um, so my point is I have some outcomes that I want to create as well for business people, even for consumers to understand the marketing and business world. Um, you know, to be smarter about that. And yeah. so um, I, th I think that's how that goes. Yeah. So what did the early days of your career look like? Well, I worked in an agency for over 20 years that were, that supported clients for the most part in the direct mail space, which is, you know, you know, which is, you know, pre-internet. Um, I mean, the psych the psychological principles that drive effective marketing definitely migrate and totally apply from direct mail to TV to internet to skywriting or whatever it is anybody wants to do. Um, but the tactics in those platforms, of course, vary. Um, and so, you know, I worked in an agency and I had, you know, clients. Um, the clients were never handed to me. It was always, here's your phone, here's your office. Really? Knock yourself out. Start dialing. <laughs> right. So I mean, when I was 23, I called Rodale, which published Prevention at that time. Men's Health wasn't born yet; it wasn't launched yet. And um, you know, I had no business calling that company at the age of 23. I had no business doing it. I had no training to do it. And yet, I called a guy who I still know and am friends with, named Pat Kapora, who was running. The I interviewed him. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Oh, awesome! I got to hear that. Yeah. Send me a link. I'll send it. Yeah. That's awesome. I had no idea he was even like being interviewed, but um, not really. But I, you know, persisted. Oh, good for yes. you! Yeah, I got to hear that. I got to see that one. Yeah. Um, so, uh, wow, blows me away. So, I, you know, I I called him when I was twenty three, and he was just a year or two older than I was, and he was working on the marketing at prevention. And so, I had no training, no. I just called and said whatever I said. I think the power and the effectiveness of that call was more about my ignorance than my knowledge. <laughs> Because if I knew his reputation as kind of a tough dude, even in his early 20s, and the reputation of Rodale in terms of being able to, you know, get in there as an as an advisor, <clears throat> I either would not have called or would just would have been too shaky to actually, you know, have the call be have any kind of effectiveness. Right. Um, so when I called, I just said, "Can I come down and talk to you?" And he said, "Yes." <laughs> um, and uh, with you know, it just not really how you do anything. Like, well, I guess you could, you know, sometimes not knowing how to do things, you know, kind of opens doors. Um, so, you know, we started working on prevention marketing together and he pretty quickly moved over to their book business, which at the time was something they thought they should possibly just close down because it wasn't working. <clears throat> and, um, and then I was, one, I mean, I was, certainly wasn't the only person, but I was one of the key outside advisors that helped to build their book business from you know ground zero or lower to you know like a, a, a mid a mid nine figure business yeah, it's you amazing. Know, annually so <clears throat> um, I mean so the, or so in the early I mean that was something that I started at the beginning of my career and kind of wrote it and really nurtured it and loved every second of it for you know 17 18 years and 
ultimately other clients came on really because they knew I was helping Rodale and they wanted to know what I knew or at least avail themselves of what I knew. Right. So what was working and what didn't work when you were working with Rodale? <clears throat> In terms of products and campaigns? Yeah. Well, when you're that prolific as a, as a product developer, you you know, just like someone who gets to bat in baseball, I mean, I'm not a big sports fan, but the analogies sometimes are perfect. Um, if you get to bat a lot, a good average is, you know, 300. Right. Um, and in product development, you know, that's probably about, maybe about the same. Um, you know, in infomercials, it's quite a bit lower. Um, but when you've got good research and you're able to survey your customers and ask them what they're interested in, you know, present po possible titles of actual future books, you know, begin to introduce some of the marketing language. I mean, there's ways to craft those surveys that actually can generate some very um, reliable results. Um, but even those things are not foolproof. So um, <clears throat> there were there were many many failed launches, but um, you know, many historically like gargantuan nine mile grand slams that that they in terms of books that they published. Doctor's Book of Home Remedies was one. Oh, I love that book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, New Choices in Natural Healing was even bigger. Um, a very famous um, direct mail package written by Gary Bensavenga, who spoke at the Titans event yeah. a month ago. Um, and, and once again, these were books that were sold to you know huge, huge audiences, tens of millions of prospects, most of whom had no prior transaction history yeah. in health and wellness. Yeah, you know, which dem which demonstrates um, you know the power of this subject of health. And you know, the other thing that was that's massively important, and to every person listening, and this will be true forever, is this idea that was sort of given a name by my friend Dean Graziosi, who's a personality in the real estate education world. And the concept is called marketing stamina. And the point is that when you launch a product or a service and do not get the, the results needed to continue, it doesn't mean that you failed. It means the first shot didn't work. The point is, and generally what the problem is, is the product or the service Maybe it's a, either the product or the service isn't good. It's a good product or service with a price that's too high. Or the product and the price are fine, but your copy is no good. Mm -hmm. so, the, so marketing stamina is this idea that if you have good research on a product or a good hunch about it or what, you know, whatever level of confidence you have, don't take one swing of the bat and miss and decide it's a, it's a, it's a dead project. You know, I mean, at Rodale and any company that's prolific, and and is a like tests a lot of creative approaches, um, can attest to the fact that and, and and the case was true. This was true of the book New Choices in Natural Healing at Rodale Prevention. Um, when they first launched the book in the in direct mail, um, there were two creative approaches from different creative teams tested against each other in the same campaign. Hmm. Version A, version B totally different writers and two of the best writers in the history of the world and both failed really so it's like putting up your cleanup batters and they both strike out right so that was pretty compelling evidence that this thing was dead why do you think it didn't work or why was it dead well it was dead at at first uh -huh. because the, you know great writers just like great athletes miss the ball sometimes you know, when you swing for home runs, you're not that you won't always hit one. Right. But in the second campaign, they went to Gary Bensavenga, who wrote a different third approach now, mm -hmm. second campaign, but third creative version, and hit the ball like, you know, halfway across the country. Right. Like so far out of the park, it was ridiculous. And so it turned a, a, like a miserable failure into a historic type, like crazy. Mm -hmm home run that sold millions of books. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if direct response book sales were on the New York Times bestseller list, which they're not, that book would have been number one for like a year and a half with no, con with no, no threats to the, you know, to the throne, right? So, mm -hmm. so, so marketing stamina is the idea that if you fail, you're not done. Mm -hmm. Now, 
there's a fine line between persevering on a, on a, on a one-time failure and sticking with something for too long. Right. That's what I was going to ask because it, you have to, it's expensive. You have to wait a long time. What made them try it again? Well, they had research and they, you know, they had enough research from a, from a, a, a statistically valid research process to know that their customers actually were interested in the book. So what they really felt was we have a great product that just hasn't been sold effectively. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they put up the best batter of all time, Gary Bensavenga, mm -hmm. and, you know, the rest literally is history. Um, so what did he do? He, he just, he, he, wrote, <laughs> he actually wrote, um, he wrote a creative uh, piece in a physical format that was called a book -a -log, which is sort of like the size of Reader's Digest. Mm -hmm. It's actually, I mean, it looks like a little pamphlet or a magazine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and like 60 some odd pages you know there's a lot of content in there I mean I mean this is sort of like a predecessor to today's on world online world where we know to build relationship to build reciprocity to get people to love us we need to be very freely giving valuable content before we ask for a transaction mm -hmm. right some people I mean Marie Forleo, Ramit Sethi, you know Derek Halpern, Jonathan Fields I mean these are all dear friends of mine who you know, in many cases, produce and provide like valuable content every week of the year. And sometimes, like in Marie's case, she sells her course for two weeks of the year. Right. And the other 50 weeks of the year, you're getting incredible free, free content. Yeah. So back to that book a log, it was, you know, it was, you know, Gary wanted a lot of content in there. And it really built a case for buying this book to get a more complete picture, but it, he wasn't waving carrots throughout the copy. He was actually giving you something that you could actually use, whether you bought the book or not. Yeah. So, and that you know, and of course that is kind of like the way to do things these days. And right. and I'm sure we'll be because you know once again that that's not gonna it's not gonna go backwards. You know, like you can't put toothpaste back in a tube after it's out. Of course, it's out of the barn or whatever. So, right. um, you know, once once you set the standard to be that to 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 generate relationships with that kind of generosity, there's no turning back. And anybody that wants to play, I mean, yeah, there are people that are paying for traffic on the internet and sending people directly to a sales page, and it's and they want to immediately buy this and that. That has its place. You know, there are people that do that responsibly and effectively. Um, but here's the thing. You can't send people directly to a sales page and ask them for a very substantially large transaction. If you want hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars, you need to nourish people with free content for generally a considerable period of time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So after talking to Pat and... Roaddale, what was another big turning point for you? Um, well, I mean, I would fast forward to uh, to 2000 because, I, you know, one of your questions was about challenges or roadblocks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I was passionate for a real long time and still am about work culture and how work culture and marketing actually, you know, in many ways dovetail or interface in terms of how a business presents itself to the marketplace and um, and also how effective work cultures are at the foundation of effective companies you know yeah. if you you probably have, you may have read delivering happiness by Tony Shea yes. I'm actually listening to peak I just listened to peak I don't know if you by Chip Conley which is talks exactly about this too yeah well Chip had the joie de vivre hotels yes. which are which are which he sold but are known you know for sort of his touch and Tony Shea, the, Z, the CEO of Zappos, wrote yeah. "Delivering Happiness." Um, so, uh, so in the year 2000, I actually decided to leave marketing, move into a consultancy around work culture and leadership um, for or, for substantial organizations. And um, I had th uh, three partners, and we presented to Goldman Sachs and some, you know, some very big global companies. Um, and had some good reception and booked some booked some engagements, but ultimately, you know, 2000 was a tough year in the financial markets. It was a tough year in, in professional services. Even some of the big companies, the global companies like McKinsey and of that 
ilk were you know having challenges and so our business you know in the in the time frame we needed it to take off didn't take off so with so re literally a year to the day um, I went back to the agency that I had been with I had already given up my entire portfolio of business to the account team oh, wow. that had, to the people that had been supporting me but you had built for decades uh, at that point you know 15 16 years yeah um, basically handed it to them and they built new lives and new incomes and new relationships out of that and which which made sense because I trained them and so if I come back it makes sense that they're good enough to handle that business right. so I came back to build a new book of business and, and once again just like 16 years before here's your phone here's your office <laughs> knock yourself out um, and it came you know it came together not easily but you know it wasn't Torture. I mean, you know, it wasn't like getting water out of a rock. I mean, my What'd relation. Well, my relationships basically showed up for me yeah. in terms of every all the people I knew that weren't a part of that core account group that my team had sort of assumed responsibility for. Mm -hmm. And I built a new, um, you know, sort of a new ecosystem for myself and a whole new group of accounts. Um, but then, you know, but at that point, within, you know, within five or six years, I, I then had my eyes on the internet, which this organization was not, you know, not doing much work in, and, you know, they were doing some rental, like CPM emails, email rentals, but, you know, not in strategy, not in creative execution, not in positioning, not in, you know, the kind of optimization stuff that I do. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point, I, I went out on my own, staying in the marketing world and staying in the health and wellness and personal development categories, but just migrating into, you know, like sort of head first into the deep end of the internet. And, um, you know, there were a few people that literally took me by the hand and escorted me into masterminds and conferences with the very highest sort of players, the high integrity, high success, mm -hmm. most respected players in the business. Um, and a guy named Michael Lovich was one of those people. And, um, you know, really Michael Lovich and Joe Polish were the two guys that um, really got under my wings in a big, big way. Um, and, you know, so that's, that was, that was, you know, that was huge too. You know, re I mean, relationship equity is the most important thing anybody ever has. Um, you know, it, it, it virtually competes with, with your knowledge of even how to do what you do. Um, because you know, if, even if you know how to do what you do, you're not going to have anyone to do it for mm -hmm. if you don't know how to nourish uh, great relationships. Mm -hmm. So, Michael, you have, who are some other mentors that are big influence on you and what did they, <clears throat> they teach you? Um, well, Eugene Schwartz, for sure. Um, he wrote a book in 1966 called Breakthrough Advertising, which will be relevant a thousand years from now. And, you know, a lot of people have said it's the best internet marketing book around, and it was written in 1966. Right. It's, it's a very deep dive into consumer behavior and consumer psychology, why people want the things that they want, how to speak to them, how to write copy to the various states of desire. Um, you know, Ramit Sethi from I Will Teach You to Be Rich, you know, has said it's one of the most sophisticated books on consumer psychology ever written and, you know, responsible for millions of dollars in incremental revenue to his business in terms of executing what's in that book. Mm -hmm. um, and Gene was a, a mentor of mine in my, you know, 20s. And I, I guess he passed a long time ago, but um, he was a real inspiration. Um, and uh, certainly Pat Kapora as well, who, uh, was one of the presidents at Rodale for 20 years before going to America Online and uh, a few other businesses after that. Mm -hmm. What did Pat teach you? <sighs> oh, a lot. Um, you know, Pat. Pat really is is uh, he's one of the few people that really is a master in a number of different business areas, from marketing to HR to operations to finance to you know all that kind of stuff. So. Um, I think probably leadership, because um, 
you know, he always, as smart as he is, he, he's always had people in the various functional areas that were smarter than he was mm -hmm. in some case. I mean, he grew up as a finance and marketing guy. So he has he has superpowers in those areas, yeah. but he was never afraid to hire giants. I mean, so you know, somebody somewhere said I just heard a quote the other day. Um, you know, A peop, you know, A leaders hire A's, but B leaders hire C's. <clears throat> um, you know, a B leader wants everybody to kind of be subservient and even not even quite as smart. I mean, I would say A's hire A pluses, <laughs> right? You know, A's want everyone around them to be smarter, and they're not threatened by that. And what they want to do is is provide leadership so that those people are nourished, and they can do the best possible work. Yeah. So looking back, Michael, what's some of the big lessons you've learned in your career? Um, well, I gave you one in a tactical sense, which is marketing stamina. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the other one that's that's big, and you know, it's a subject of a book recently by Adam Grant called Give and Take, yeah. <clears throat> which is what I call leading with generosity. And like there's this word networking that we all know, you know, but it, it's such a bankrupt word because it embedded in the word networking is the fact that people that do it have an agenda. And if you have an agenda at a party or a business meeting, people can sniff that out a mile away. You know, and it's you know you're you're speaking to someone, but your eyes are darting to other badges or other like who's who's the next person that I can talk to that's better for me than you. Right. Um, you know, people talk about you know Bill Clinton or others, you know, and the charisma that they have, and the memory they have for the people they meet because when you talk to them, you're the only person in the room to them. Right. And I think effective. You know, number one, networking is is kind of a bankrupt word, but I think leading with generosity is about definitely choosing your spots in terms of events or you know venues that you're going to go to. But when you're there, trust your choice. <coughs> and if you're talking to someone, make them not only the only person in the room, but the only person in the world. <coughs> and and also be generous. Like try find out what they're challenged by and see if you can solve it yeah. um, as opposed to what you know can you leave with five business cards or you know ten leads or what you know that just doesn't fly anymore you know and look if somebody has to pay their rent next month I understand that this is a longer term play and you know re you know people that need money need money but you know for the bottom line is if you want a working strategy that'll serve you your whole life Build relationships and lead with generosity, and solve other people's problems as mm. a priority, and um, and really without an expectation in return, even from that person. Right. Somebody else will pay them. You know, yeah. it's like you know, and once again, it's not a new agey concept, yeah. but it just sort of works. I mean, ask anybody in business. Right. You know, someone else will pay you back. You know, will pay that debt. Yeah. You know, it comes. When you generate that way, yeah. it actually, I mean, in a very practical sense, it builds your reputation, it builds your brand as a, as a participant in that yeah. business ecosystem, and, you know, it, it'll come back to you. Yeah. I think Brian Kurtz uh, embodies that type of philosophy and thinking. I know you guys are in a mastermind together. Yeah, we've been yeah. close friends for, a, like, since 1988. Yeah. Maybe earlier, 85, probably. Um so uh, there's no doubt that Brian lives that. Uh, yeah. He's a beautiful example. Yeah. So, Michael, since it's Inspired Insider, <clears throat> um, tell me about your lowest moment and then how you pushed through it. Well, I th um, it's funny because I, I think the <clears> – <throat> I think in – in like May 2001, learning that our consulting business in work culture and leadership wasn't going to fly was a tough space. That was a tough spot. And I mentioned that a few minutes ago. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and how I persevered was what I said. You know, I, I had relationships that kind of buoyed me, that got under my wings, and that enabled me to, to sort of come back um, without ever really going into personal scarcity or hardship. Um, and you know, and having you know, having 
having a you know a CEO at that agency whose name is Lonnie Mandel who still leads it you know have, I mean his, my relationship with him was was also important too not just relationships with clients but relationships with the guy that I had worked for at that point for 16 or 17 years who ran that agency and owned it and my relationship with him was critical in terms of him believing in me that I could you know rebuild and um you know, and and him, you know, providing some financial cushions during that process. You know, that relationship was as key as as any client relationships or or external relationships. Yeah. So, what's been one of the proudest moments? <clears throat> proudest? Yeah, proudest. Hmm. Well, I have three awesome kids. <laughs> that I have I, a question in there about your kids, actually. Yeah. Um. Proudest moments. It's a tough, tough call, man. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's a, I don't know if there's a moment, but I think just, um, you know, there aren't a lot of people that have um, sort of done the migration from offline to online. You know, um, you know, it's kind of like selling typewriters. It's like you know, if you're trying to do that, it's like those days are over, you know. And so I, I, maybe not a moment, but just something I'm proud of is really taking the dive into the Internet and really making that my home. And, under, you know, bringing everything I know about psychology, consumer psychology and marketing and also the content areas where I've specialized in and just sort of packing that up and, you know, putting it in the U-Haul and moving it over to this, thing called the internet yeah. where the tactics are different but they totally you know the, the best tactics are still connected to the best psychological insights yeah um, and just just m making that migration and doing it you know I think with some degree of effectiveness or so I'm told um, I mean it continues to support me in a great way and you know the people around me are, are you know there's there's demand for me which I'm very grateful and and don't take for granted at all. Um, well, what's so, one of those proud times where you did take that knowledge to the online world and helped a particular company? Because I'm sure that's uh, proud. Yeah. Well, I think. I mean, look, look. I mean, inter once again, looking at list building in the online space, getting people to engage in a relationship with you by way of providing their email address, which is a very significant event because once again, that's your most important source of ongoing relationships and ongoing business and you know taking what I learned about consumer psychology and marketing and language and how people respond to language and colors and photos and words and typefaces and so forth and helping people improve their opt-in rate by 300 percent 500 percent 700 percent I mean 40 percent is you could have a party for 40%. Right. You know, to get 300, 500, 700, I'm very, I'm very proud of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Michael, I know we're just about at the time. Um, there's so many other questions, so I'm going to stick to... Uh, first of all, I have one last question, but tell people where they can find you online. What are you working on lately that's exciting? Sure. Um, well, michaelfishmanconsulting.com, um, but uh, even just in terms of day-to-day -day communication, um, you know, Twitter and Facebook um, are, you know, stuff I'm looking at each day. You'll easily find me there. Um, private message on Facebook, facebook.com slash michaelfishman, twitter.com slash michaelfishman. Um, <clears throat> you know, right now, you know, continuing um, to support clients in advisory and consulting relationships, um, you know, like Bulletproof or Dr. Daniel Amen, Dr. Mark Hyman, people like that. Um, but also, ha you know, having the opportunity to invest in, some, in early stage uh, tech startups in the, you know, health world. So being an, uh, an investor and advisor um, now to, you know, I've done it three times but, and have several more coming up. So that's super exciting, you know. Not only you want to mention them, so people can check them out. <clears throat> um, well, the ones the ones that I'm in are um, 
Pavlock, P A V L O K dot com, um, and Zona dot com, Z O N A dot com. Um, and I was in, I was in um, something called Basis Science, but that sold to Intel about maybe seven or eight months ago. So that was a nice outcome. Congratulations, yeah. Thank you. And uh, the ones I'm about to jump into, I'll, I'll hold those for another time. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, but um, so yeah, those. I mean, that's yeah. it's exciting to to get to sort of play with inspired entrepreneurs, you know, and uh, yeah. uh, to to help and also to to take the ride up, uh, you know, from, from a financial perspective as well. Just you know, it sort of yeah, put some some skin in the game. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So, Michael, my last question, even though I didn't even get to ask about BehaviorCon, Consumer Health Summit, all these things, what's a day in, you know, there's so much to ask about, but what's a day in the life look like? I know you have three kids, you have tons of projects going on. Yeah. What does that look like? Well, my kids are in their 20s. So okay. So, they're, uh, they're flourishing, making their own, you know, mark in the world. Yeah. Each one of them in, in a great way. Um, what are they going to do? What are they uh, with your well, my influence? Old, yeah. My older daughter is in uh, marketing, consumer okay. uh, uh, marketing, and my son is in uh, consulting, and my younger daughter um, is figuring things out right now. But you know, has a degree in education and has worked for Disney, and oh, cool. you know, loves working with kids. So um, they're all doing fantastic. Awesome. Because um, before they were twenty, they were ten, they were five, they were one, they were a month. You still had to manage all that, with, especially with three kids. Well, look, I'm sure I, I'm sure I totally blew it at times. <laughs> um, we all do, yeah. But uh, you know, I, I think having having an awareness as you know, you know, I'm, I'm I think kids find their own conviction. The word we started with. Um, I think that they. I think the best way to uh, to have, for kids to have conviction is to allow them to find it for themselves, or at least give them the opportunity mm -hmm. and the playing field. Not necessarily sports, but like the the opportunity to I, to locate it for themselves. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, I mm -hmm. never every night said, "Where's your homework?" or "Did you study?" or I mean, I just didn't do that because I didn't think it was the way to go. Um, you know, because I think if they find their own incentive and motivation. Um, you know that's sustainable. Yeah. To impose to impose it and have them do it because they're afraid of me. That you know doesn't give them a way to sustain that throughout their lifetime. But if they can uncork or identify that wellspring of conviction and ambition and and purpose, <clears throat> once they identify that for themselves, the, the the you know the flame will never go out. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that that. You know, <laughs> e easier said than done, but for sure, you know, I I think um, you know I think that you know between myself and their mom, we I think that's one thing we probably um, did hopefully you know somewhat well. Yeah, yeah. So many questions. No more time, Michael. <laughs> I, I swear, this could have gone for ten hours. But I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Any parting words? Before uh, we end, well, they, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, this was not only an honor but a lot of fun, and um, you know, I, I hope uh, for each person listening, there was uh, some value here and something that, you know, I mean, you know, for you, for you listening, you know, find one or two action steps, or just find one, and and take action, or do a test, or or commit to yourself. To start doing something that would support you, or stop doing something that wouldn't that doesn't support you. Um, and the key to, the key to remember is that um, you know most people think we get motivated and then we take action, but it's really we take action and then we get motivated. That's a good one. So you know motivation doesn't sustain all by itself, but action will create motivation that will you know have a better mm -hmm. shot to to sort of fuel you forward. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I mean, that's one of the biggest misconceptions around. So just, you know, get unreasonable with yourself to find an action to take. And, you know, I think most people can identify with that 
you know, already, but it's a probably a good reminder. Yes. From the consumer psychology expert, <laughs> Michael, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Jeremy, this was fantastic. A, this was an awesome treat. Thank you again so much. Thank you.